you're going to be paying taxes for the rest of your life. And so if you learn how to save money on taxes, that's not an expense. Mm -hmm. That's an investment. Mm -hmm. And it's an investment that's going to pay dividends for as long as you're a taxpayer, mm -hmm. which is going to be the rest of your life. What's up, you guys? It's your girl, Rose. Welcome back to my channel. Wow, I cannot believe how quickly this year is going by. We're already a few months into the year, which means it is now tax season. Now, I'm sure you're very familiar with the process of filing your taxes. It's something we all have to do every single year, like it or not. But you know what's really uncharted territory? Crypto taxes. For example, do you have to worry about taxes if you made a bunch of money last year? What if you switched Bitcoin into Ethereum? Do you owe taxes? There's a lot of questions. And unfortunately, accountants are not super well versed in this area just yet because it's so new which is why I'm so excited to bring on a very special guest for today, Tabo Abate. Tabo is the founder of Arbitus Group, which is a boutique accounting firm that specializes in taxes for crypto and blockchain. His services are in super high demand right now. In fact, if you want to work with him one-on-one, -on -one, you have to join a super long waiting list. So I feel very lucky to have him on today. We're going to be covering a range of topics from tips and tricks to eliminating slash reducing your taxes, whether or not you owe taxes, how to figure that out. And we'll even touch on NFT taxes. So a good range of topics. Hey, Tavo, thank you so much for being here today. Rose, thank you so much for having me on the channel. I'm really excited to kind of cover this topic, something that's very near and dear to my heart. And I think something that we're going to give a lot of value to your listeners too. Yeah, for sure. So I think it's just really cool how you've merged your passion for crypto because you're a believer yourself, not just a professional working with it. And you also merged your extensive tax experience. So can we just start from the beginning? Oh, by the way, you have a blast doing all this, which is even cooler. <laughs> so can you just start from the beginning, how you got started in crypto and all of this? Yeah, from the beginning. So I guess the real way I got started in crypto was back in 2016. I had a good friend of mine from college who was super into crypto very early, was a big Bitcoin guy. And I was living in Miami at the time, and he actually came and stayed at and crashed on my couch while he was in Miami for a conference. And every day he came back from this conference super excited and super pumped to talk about Bitcoin and Bitcoin and Bitcoin. And I talked to him and I was very skeptical at first. I you know, didn't really believe it, thought it was just this weird kind of gambling type thing. And I kept having, having questions for him. And every question I had, he had a really intelligent, thoughtful answer to. And after that weekend, I was like, you know, I need to do a little bit more research. And that's when I fell down the rabbit hole, so to speak, of learning about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And after that, as I just started learning more and more, I realized that, whoa, this isn't just some speculative gambling thing. This is, this is a big deal. This is going to completely change the way that money works, that finance works, that value works. Um, and that's really what got me into Bitcoin. Um, and then after I got into Bitcoin, uh, I got a bunch of my friends into it as well. And we all started out as traders. So um, just on the side, you know, buying on uh, Coinbase, Binance, Kraken, all those different things and, and selling, not at a super high level. But I realized that uh, after I'd been trading for a few months that, and by the way, I'm a CPA and all my friends are CPAs. We're all trading together. After a few months, we realized that we owed taxes on this. And none of us knew how to pay taxes on it. None of us knew the rules. And that was this light bulb moment for me because I said, oh my God, I'm a CPA. I work in public accounting. All my friends are in the same boat and we don't know the right way to pay taxes on what we've been doing. There's no way that all these other people out there who are trading and doing the same stuff as us back in 2016 are doing it right and probably not even doing it at all. And for me, that was kind of a light bulb moment because I realized that cryptocurrency was here to stay and that you're going to need to pay taxes on it. And no one really knew how to do it and do it right. And that was inspiration behind starting the firm and behind what we started, which was working directly with cryptocurrency investors, educating them and helping them to pay taxes and pay their fair share, but not a penny more. Mm -hmm. And that's really what, what got us in the, in the game. I love it. It's such a niche, valuable service that you provide. And also just the story of how you started that business. I think that warrants a whole nother video in, in and of <laughs> itself, your entrepreneurial journey. 
Um, but I just love that you you first learned about Bitcoin from an eccentric friend who was really passionate about it. And actually, I, that's how I learned about it. I learned about it from yeah. an eccentric person that I met at Burning Man who was very passionate about it. Yep. And I thought he was crazy at first, but me too. Yeah, the more you hear about <laughs> it, it's a real thing. Um, so I would, and it actually took me a couple of years to really wrap my head around what it was, just hearing it from different people in different ways. Mm -hmm. So I would love to, before we launch into all the tax stuff, just hear okay. in your words, like what is cryptocurrency? What is cryptocurrency? So one thing I always like to say before I define cryptocurrency, I draw a lot of analogies towards the internet. And so if somebody were to come to you and say, what is the internet? You wouldn't say, well, the internet is this protocol that runs on TCP IP and there's this layers of different routers that blah, blah, blah. You wouldn't go into the technicals of it. And that's the problem that a lot of people have when they're asking about what's Bitcoin is they start going in and talking about the blockchain and proof of work and all these different complicated things. But if I were to ask you, what's the internet? The answer is just, it's something that we use to communicate. It's a tool that allows us to communicate. That's really at its core what it is. And so, Cryptocurrency, at its core, what it is, it's just money that's made for the internet, money that's internet native, right? So if you think about US dollars, euros, Swiss francs, right? Those are all currencies or monies that are you know, from the old world, right? They were made before we had the internet. And Bitcoin is just, and cryptocurrency in general, is just money made for the internet. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Okay, probably the simplest explanation I've ever heard, but I like it. Yeah. By the way, if you need a more technical, in-depth explanation of cryptocurrency and how it works, check out this other video right here. But for now, we're going to go back to our interview. So going back to taxes, now that mm -hmm. we've covered sort of basic what is crypto 101, there's probably a bunch of people who have made a lot of money, maybe even millions of dollars, and a lot of people who've made maybe a couple thousand or even just a couple hundred. But probably 99% of people are going to have to do something with their taxes. Um, so how does someone know for sure whether they owe taxes or not? Yeah, so this is a really good question. And the way I'll answer this is first, I'll tell you when you don't owe taxes on your cryptocurrency. So if you just, let's say you have a Coinbase account, you just go on Coinbase and you buy some Bitcoin and you don't do anything with it. It just sits there, it goes up in value, some days it goes down, but it's just sitting in your wallet. You don't owe taxes on that. Just buying and holding something that goes up and down in value doesn't mean that you owe taxes. Now, if you do pretty much anything else mm -hmm. besides just holding it, those are gonna create what we call taxable events, which mean that you either owe taxes or in some cases might be owed a refund if you're losing money. So what that means is if you buy Bitcoin and you trade it for Ethereum, that's a taxable event which may have a gain or a loss associated with it. If you use Bitcoin to pay for something, if you're buying coffee, if you're using like a Bitcoin loaded debit card and spending it, that's a taxable event and you owe tax on that. If you're being paid in Bitcoin, that's a taxable event. So essentially anything other than just having cryptocurrency and holding on to it is going to create some sort of taxable event and you need to figure out, do I pay taxes on this or in some of the good cases, well, good from a tax perspective, can I get a refund for this loss that I've incurred? Hmm. Those are, you mentioned some things I hadn't heard about before. Like I, I know when you sell something, whether it's a stock or a piece of real estate, any asset, mm -hmm. that's when the taxable, the capital gain occurs. Yep. So I knew that about crypto, but then you mentioned if you get paid in Bitcoin or crypto, like you mm -hmm. earn money in it. Yeah. Or if you spend, you pay for something mm -hmm. in crypto, also a taxable event. Yeah. I think those were the two others. Anyway. Yeah, those are definitely ones that take people by surprise. And so the earning it isn't super complicated, right? Because for example, if you work for a company and you get paid in stock, right? Stock grants or options or things like that, you pay taxes on that, right? So there's plenty other analogies of people getting paid in not just money mm -hmm. where they owe taxes on that. And it's the same thing with Bitcoin. Um, the spending one is one that a lot of people don't think about because if you were to, for example, go spend uh, one Bitcoin on a car, right? Um, that's actually a taxable event because there's really no difference between, so let's say the car is $40,000, a Bitcoin's $40,000. There's no difference between taking that Bitcoin, selling it for cash, and then buying a car, mm -hmm. and taking the Bitcoin and buying the car, right? They both take you from, I had a Bitcoin, now I have a car. And in the one where you sell it for cash and buy a car, 
it's obvious, right? You pay mm -hmm. taxes because you sold it for cash. And it's the same thing. If you take it and spend it directly from a car, you're still getting from that same point A to point B, and it's still the same tax treatment. Wow, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I, um, I remember I was demonstrating to a friend how, to, how cryptocurrency works, and she bought me a Chipotle burrito, and I sent her some Bitcoin. Yeah. So do I owe taxes on that? <laughs> <laughs> So, $7. So, so technically you do owe taxes on that. You could say that uh, you gifted that Bitcoin to her, but if you were actually paying her back for that Chipotle burrito, technically what you would need to do is you would need to figure out how much did you buy that $7 worth of Bitcoin for. If you bought it for $3 and you got a $7 Chipotle burrito, technically that's a $4 capital gain. Oh, so that's how it works. Yeah. I thought you could be sneaky and if you don't need to go through dollars, like you have someone who's willing to give you a car directly in exchange for Bitcoin and not touch dollars at all. Mm -hmm. I thought that you could avoid taxes or something. Yeah, but no. That's not how it works. Yeah, and one thing I always tell people is, um, you know, if we talk about the IRS, which we'll probably hit on later on in this interview, is they've been in the business of collecting taxes for a long time. And they also have been in the business of figuring out ways that people try to get around paying taxes for a very long time, much longer than cryptocurrency has existed. And so that's just a very common thing is that um, most of the time, just dressing up a transaction in something that may, might not look exact isn't enough to get you out of paying taxes for it. And, and the IRS is very good at kind of realizing those little tricks or loopholes that people try to use um, and making sure that there's still rules that say you owe taxes on that. Hmm. Well, since you brought up the IRS and that's what we're all <laughs> afraid of or looking out for, how does the IRS know, given that crypto is also new and they've had to do a lot of catching up, mm -hmm. how does the IRS even know if you owe taxes how do they track all of these things, every little purchase you've made with Bitcoin and so on and so forth? Yeah, yeah. So for, for this one, um, a little bit of crypto of history might be super useful. So um, what the IRS does, and the same way that the IRS figures out if you owe taxes on money you earn from your job or money you earn from a contractor, is when you get a W-2 or a 1099 in the mail, right? Those little forms you get at tax time that say that you made this much money. Every time you get one of those forms, one of those forms is also sent to the IRS. Mm -hmm. And so the IRS goes, instead of going to every employee, they go straight to the employer and the employer tells them how much money they should be expecting from you. That same strategy is what the IRS uses on crypto. So they're not gonna go, and in some cases they do, go to each person who's buying crypto, but they're gonna go to the exchanges, the places where you buy buy and sell crypto. So they're gonna go to the Coinbases, the Krakens, the Binance of the world, and that's where they start. So uh, when I mentioned history, um, a couple of years ago, the IRS actually took Coinbase to court. Coinbase is a super, if you guys haven't heard of it, it's a really popular cryptocurrency exchange, one of the best places to buy and sell crypto. And uh, back in 2015, 16, Coinbase had, was advertising, they were this big growing company and they were advertising, hey, we've got thousands of users using our platform, lots of people trading millions of dollars with the cryptocurrency. And the IRS saw these ads saying how many users Coinbase had. And then they looked at their records and said, huh, only about a few hundred of those people actually paid taxes. And so they actually took Coinbase to court and said, hey, give us all the information on your users because you're saying all these people are, are trading crypto, we're only seeing this many tax returns coming in. There's a difference here. Clearly some people aren't. And they took Coinbase to court. Coinbase fought very valiantly to protect their customers' information. Uh, they reached a settlement and by settlement, Coinbase really kind of lost. Mm -hmm. And Coinbase ended up giving them that information. And so um, from that, and I actually have a lot of clients who receive letters from the IRS or um, requests basically saying, hey, we think you owe taxes, and they all had Coinbase accounts. And so that's the general strategy is they're gonna go to these exchanges, find the places where you're trading, get all the customer information from there, and that's how they're gonna figure out the people that who should be sending them uh, paying taxes. Hmm. Okay, so I'm pretty sure a lot of people have bought and sold on crypto, uh, on Coinbase. So where does somebody start to even, to, like do you, ask for a certain report on Coinbase? Yeah, yeah. So this is one of the things that's especially difficult about cryptocurrency taxation. So 
I'm sure most of your listeners trade stocks or have 401ks and things like that, right? So if you're trading stock, let's say on Robinhood, uh, it's really easy for Robinhood to send you a report at the end of the year because everything you do, you do with Robinhood, right? Mm -hmm. So you buy your Apple share on Robinhood and then you sell it on Robinhood and you get your dividends through Robinhood. You don't buy a share of Apple on Robinhood and then send that over to Vanguard and then swap that share for Tesla, right? You don't Mm. do any of this kind of in between different platform stuff, but you do that with cryptocurrency. And so because it's so common that you're moving assets around from place to place, what that means is no one place is gonna know your whole story, Mm -hmm. right? So if you buy some Bitcoin on Binance, and then send it to Coinbase and sell it on Coinbase, Coinbase has no idea how much you paid for that Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, because they don't know how much you paid for it, they can't figure out your gain or your loss. Mm -hmm. And so that issue, the fact that um, crypto moves around between different places and there's no one person who is in charge of all your stuff, that's why no one exchange can ever give you an accurate tax report. And some exchanges do, and they and they try, but unfortunately, a lot of times they're wrong mm-hmm. um, because they just they're either guessing or they're making estimates, um, and and a lot of times the tax reports that you get from these exchanges are incorrect. Uh, now, if you were to open up your Coinbase app and go into taxes, they'll give you a link to a software provider that they partner with, and then that software provider will help you kind of pull in your Coinbase trades and your Binance trades and all your other stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, So they're improving the process a bit, um, but that's definitely um, one thing that you need to keep in mind is that you need to find one place where you can get all those trades together. Hmm. And that's not going to be Coinbase. It's not going to be Binance. It's going to be some sort of tax software that does that for you. And so where people start is getting those records together, pulling them all together. And so maybe if you're just doing a few trades here and there on one or two exchanges, maybe that's just an Excel spreadsheet for you. Mm -hmm. But really anybody doing this at any sort of scale portfolio that's, you know, in a couple thousands to and up in dollars, you really need to use some sort of kind of software solution that's kind of crunching all these numbers for you and putting them in one place. Um, And there's plenty out there that are low cost, free, free to try um, that you can you can use to help you with that. But that's step one is just getting your records together, Mm -hmm. just pulling the information into one place. And then once you have the information, you can start to figure out what to do with it. And I'm sure we'll cover that uh, on some of the other questions you have. Okay, so step one, get your records together. Get them them together, use a tool. And if it has to be a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet, if it's some software, a software, but step one, get your records together. Mm -hmm. So just to link it back to traditional investing like stocks, it is very Mm -hmm. straightforward. Maybe the most complex it gets is I have my solo 401k at E-Trade and I have my Roth IRA at Fidelity. So Mm -hmm. I have a 1099B, which is uh, the brokerage form. They tell you how much income you made on your investments. You get that from each brokerage. So for my accountant, I just give him a 1099B from Fidelity and a 1099B from E-Trade. But that's it. Now for crypto, you're saying there is no 1099 crypto. I have to actually get all that information myself with software that pulls in information from all the places that I've traded or ever stored crypto. Yep, exactly. In, in a sense, you almost need to generate that report yourself, the one that is nor- you're, we're used to just having some custodian of our stock you know, provide that to us. Um, now with crypto, you need to do that yourself. Now there's a few small ex- exceptions to that. So um, Robinhood, for example, they allowed you to trade crypto but they don't allow you to take it off their platform. Mm. And so Robinhood is probably the one example where they can give you a crypto report at the end of the year, and it'll make sense because you're not allowed to leave. Um, Robinhood's actually changing that soon. So I think uh, within this year or next year, they're gonna allow you to take your crypto off the platform, which is great. You can do more stuff with it, but then that'll be kind of the last place where you know someone could have done the work for you. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so for me, I've bought crypto on like Swan Bitcoin because they allow you to do recurring dollar cost averaging type purchases for a very low fee. Mm -hmm. And then I've transferred it to Coinbase so that I could switch it into Ethereum. And then I've moved it to Celsius so that I can earn passive income on my crypto. And then I've moved it back to Coinbase to, to buy something else. So I've done a ton of stuff. 
So I can see why, yeah, I can't get the records just from Coinbase or just from Celsius. Yeah. I have to create that myself. Yeah, you kind of need to get the pieces of all those records from each place. Now, you did use the term 1099. There is one other caveat is that if you're using Celsius, for example, a great place where you can send them your, your cryptocurrency and they'll pay you interest, um, they can send you a 1099 for the interest that they've paid you. So they can say, hey, you know, um, Rose put one Bitcoin here over the course of a year. She earned $1,000 in interest. We paid it to her. Here's a 1099 for your interest. Mm -hmm. um, that's different than figuring out your capital gains. Got it. So you would submit a 1099 for your interest earned and then create your own report on all the, the capital gains using that software. Yeah, exactly. And also the same software will also tell you how much you earned in interest and how much you kind of got from there. So the software tells you everything. But um, you could receive a 1099 from a place if they're paying you interest, and that 1099 is generally accurate hmm. just for the interest they paid you, not any capital gains. OK. All right. So as soon as you said software, I think I personally start, started feeling a little intimidated. Cause, yeah. So is it, and you, said, you mentioned there's good free softwares. Mm -hmm. So is it pretty straightforward to get started? Yeah, yeah. And so you're right. The term software can be super intimidating. Let me put it this way. So when you're doing your taxes normally, if for any of you guys who do it on your own, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners who do, you don't print out the IRS forms from their website. You don't get all this paper. You don't pull the tax code and start like doing it. You use TurboTax. And that's all I mean by software, right? It's the TurboTax equivalent of cryptocurrency. So it's just the same way that TurboTax pulls all your 1099s together, pulls your W-2s, asks you the certain questions you need to ask. That's a software. The same, a similar kind of thing with cryptocurrency, using a software that's going to make it easier for you, not harder, not more complicated. Mm -hmm. OK, so you choose a software, and then you enter in all your accounts. I have an account at Coinbase mm -hmm. and Celsius. And then they'll just pull in the data and just like spit out what yeah. you owe in taxes. Yeah. So like the, all the software options out there will link to an exchange. So they'll use like an API and they'll pull in just your Coinbase trades, your Binance trades. Um, they'll even be able to, let's say you're using uh, like a decentralized exchange like MetaMask or, or Uniswap. Um, it can pull stuff from the blockchain. All the different places you could be doing crypto stuff. One of these uh, tools will help you kind of gather all that information into one place. Oh, and that's kind of the, the starting point. <laughs> OK, so what are what's like your top three, two or three free and easy to use softwares? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, probably my top one, and this is the one that's kind of partnered with Coinbase and TurboTax, would be Cointracker.io. Super um, friendly, user user friendly interface. Um, they do a really good job kind of making it easy and simple, especially if you're a Coinbase user, you can plug right in with them. Um, another one that I like who I've worked with their team um, specifically is Zen Ledger. So Zen Ledger, uh, great software, also really intuitive. Um, and there's also a free one that's offered by Crypto.com. Um, if you can go on their website, they've got a free tool that you can use as well. Uh, probably not as robust as the other two, but if you're not doing a ton of crazy stuff, free is nice. Um, also with Zen Ledger and Coin Tracker, um, if you only have a small amount of trades, you can try it out for free. Uh, so that's another thing. So you can actually go in, kind of play with this software, use it for a few trades, make sure you like it before you buy it. Okay. All right. So, so kind will... of low risk. Okay, good. Yeah, I'll definitely link to all of those things below. I'll be checking them out myself, that's for sure. So step one is to get your records together using the software, because um, DIY through a spreadsheet doesn't sound very feasible. What are some common mistakes that people should make sure to avoid when it comes to crypto taxes? Ooh, yeah, common mistakes. So one of the most common mistakes is not taking the time to learn the rules, right? And just thinking that you don't owe taxes on this. And probably the most common mistake at a high level is a lot of people think that, oh, the IRS is never going to know. All this stuff is anonymous and decentralized. And that's actually definitely not the case. Um, when we can kind of talk a little bit more about that a little later. But probably one of the most common mistakes is not realizing, like I mentioned before, that crypto to crypto exchanges are taxable. So the number one question and mistake that I see is people think, oh, I don't owe taxes because I just went from Bitcoin to Ethereum to XRP to back to Ethereum, and I never cashed out, so to speak. But 
That's not the case. That's not the rules. Um, any kind of swapping of assets is taxable. So that's mistake number one. Um, one another really common one, uh, so to all my Excel spreadsheet people out there, um, there's this thing called a gas fee or a transaction fee whenever you're using a cryptocurrency. It's usually a small amount. Those are tax deductible. So, um, when, so it's important to take those little amounts and sum them up. And so another big mistake, especially for people who try to do it on their own, they don't capture all those tiny little fees that they're paying to use the network. And those are going to actually reduce your taxes and get you a bigger refund. Oh, so nice. uh, remembering I did to not include know that. those. Yep. And again, software does that all automatically for you. Oh, nice. So that software we talked about. All of them. Does yep. it all for you. Amazing. Any other common tax mistakes? Um, another common one is uh, not understanding the rules or the differences between income and capital gains. And so with crypto, which is a, a little different from stocks, but not really, because with stocks, you can have income in the form of dividends. Um, and then you have capital gains when you actually dispose or sell that, sell that stock. And it's similar with crypto. So you can have income, so you can earn interest from like a place like Celsius. You could do something called staking in cryptocurrency where you basically lock up your crypto and earn small rewards, um, getting paid in it. N without getting too into the weeds, it's just important to know that the rules around income are different than the rules around capital gains. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the, 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 another big mistake people make is not understanding that those are taxed a little bit differently. Okay. Can you give us an example? Yeah, yeah. So for example, um, with income, you owe taxes on that regardless of what happens. So let's say that you, um, there's a hard fork, which is this thing that happens. It's unique in cryptocurrency where like a, a network might split into two. And then, um, so like, let's say that Bitcoin Cash was an example of a hard fork. So if you own Bitcoin up to a certain date and then the Bitcoin network split in two because people couldn't agree, then you got some Bitcoin Cash and some Bitcoin. Um, that Bitcoin Cash that you received is income, meaning that you owe taxes on that right away. Um, if you then, so let's say you got that in November, you owe taxes on that for the year. Mm -hmm. um, you could sell that in February or March of the next year, but the taxes happen right away in the time that you get it. Um, so if you don't understand that and don't understand like when the taxes are due on income, which is you know in, as soon as it happens, uh, that's a, that's the thing that can trip people up and cause them to get surprise tax bills. Mm. Speaking of surprise tax bills, I'm sure you have a lot of interesting stories, maybe some horror stories of clients who have called you in desperation or just really got hit with like a million dollar tax bill. Yeah. Everybody's worst nightmare. Do you have some horror stories that you can share with us? Yeah, yeah, I definitely do have some horror stories. So one tip that I, I always like to tell people about is that you can take out loans against your cryptocurrency. Um, and if you take a loan against cryptocurrency, it's actually not taxable. So let's say I have, I'm gonna use big round numbers, let's say I have a million dollars worth of Bitcoin. I could put that down uh, as collateral and get $500,000 loaned to me in cash. And that transaction of me putting my bit Bitcoin, getting cash, that's not taxable because mm. it's just borrowing. I haven't actually sold my assets. So I actually teach that as a tip that people can use. So maybe um, you, know, you wanna keep your Bitcoin but you need cash, that might be a good way to get it without having to sell it. Mm -hmm. So that's a good tip. What happens is that when you put that up for um, uh, as collateral, if the value of Bitcoin drops, uh, the person who loaned you that money might panic mm. um, and, and they might need to sell that Bitcoin if the value drops. And so probably one of the biggest horror stories I saw was um, in 2020, during there was a big stock market crash and cryptocurrency crash, a lot of these people who had these loans um, had their Bitcoin basically liquidated because the value crashed and the person who, the companies that gave them the loans had to sell their Bitcoin to cover the loan amount. And, and then not, they had to pay the loan back right away? No, so they, so they, so let's say um, that example where a million dollars of Bitcoin get a half a million dollar loan. If the value of Bitcoin drops to half a million dollars, so basically your collateral equals the loan, mm -hmm. they'll sell that Bitcoin, pay off your loan. So the good thing is you don't owe any more, owe any money. The bad thing is you don't have your Bitcoin, 
and you actually get a tax bill <gasps> on that Bitcoin being liquidated by the lender. Because oh. let's say you bought that Bitcoin for a hundred thousand, it was worth a million when you put it for the loan. Even though the lender sold it at half a mil to cover your loan and you're at zero, that's still a four hundred thousand dollar gain Ouch. in the tax bill. So the biggest horror stories I have were from March of 2020 during the pandemic, where I had all these guys who had been buying Bitcoin since back when it was under a thousand dollars, and they had it liquidated. And not only did they lose their Bitcoin, but they had a big tax bill. So. <sighs> Wow. Crypto backed loans, really great strategy for minimizing taxes, but you got to be careful on um, liquidations. Wow. Yeah, because if you can control when you sell the Bitcoin, you can use certain tax tricks to mm -hmm. do it in a year that it won't be too much tax. Like when you can control it, that's OK. But yeah. when someone liquidates your Bitcoin and you, you don't find out till afterwards, yeah. yeah, that could be a nightmare. That's that definitely was a, was a big nightmare for for a lot of people. And you had to clean up that mess. Yeah, we cleaned that mess up. Um, another big nightmare is something that I always tell people to be cautious on is you can also trade cryptocurrency on margin, which is basically just a fancy way to say you can buy and trade more crypto than you actually have in your account using leverage. Um, and that's really great because you can make a lot of money, but you can also lose a lot of money really quickly. Money that you don't have. Right. And so what can happen is, let's say you start out with $1,000 worth of Bitcoin. Let's say you trade it all the way up to a million dollars. Um, and then the year ends. At, in December, you've got a million dollars and you owe taxes on that. If you then lose all of that money the next year in January or February that you made trading on margin, you still owe the taxes. And so another big horror story I've seen is clients who make a ton of money um, trading on margin and then end up paying more in taxes than what they have at the end of the day because they can lose it all just as quick. Hmm. And they, they didn't set aside some of those profits to pay the tax bill. No. Nope. If they yeah. had set aside money. Then they would have been OK. Mm -hmm. Then you would, even if they lost all the money, at least they set aside to pay for the taxes. Um, so that's definitely a big takeaway is if you're making a ton of money on crypto, take a little bit, sell a little bit if you need to, set aside that money to pay taxes um, so that you don't get stuck in one of those situations. Hmm. It's just like being self-employed. You have to put away money for taxes. Yeah. So let's say in one year you traded on margin, you made, you turned $1,000 into $10,000. We'll mm -hmm. just use clean numbers. So you made $9,000 in 2021. Mm -hmm. So then you, the smart thing to do is set aside the about three grand, you know, a third of that. Mm -hmm. Just put it away. Do not touch it. You will owe that money yes. for 2021. Yeah. And then in 2022 is a different tax year. Exactly. So if you lose a bunch of money, you'll get a refund for 2022, but you still owe a tax bill for 2021. Yep, exactly. And then also one of the things that's kind of unfortunate um, and I feel like we're talking a lot of like gloom and doom in this first part. <laughs> we're going to get to like strategies on ways to save and ways to use this to your advantage. But um, another thing that people, a lot of people don't realize is that when you're making gains, the IRS wants all their money and they want it right now. When you're taking losses, there's limits to how much of a loss you can claim um, in any given year. And so if in year one you make, uh, you know, 100K in gains, and then in year two, you take 100K in losses, you're oftentimes not able to take that full amount of a loss on your tax return, and you might need to spread that out over time. Um, so that's definitely something to understand is that when you're making money, you owe it right away. When you're losing money, you might not be able to claim all those losses right away. Mm, you have to phase it out. Yeah, there's, there's certain limits, um, which might be a little too in the, de in, in the weeds, but the, the, the point is that um, there are limits to how much you can take as a, a loss on capital gains, on mm -hmm. capital losses per Got year. Got it. Well, I have a feeling 2021 was a good year for crypto, so most people will owe, if anything. Maybe this yeah. year will be different. Yeah, and, and the thing is, you want to owe money, because if you're owing money, that means that you made money, exactly. generally speaking. <laughs> so, uh, you know, nobody likes paying taxes, um, and we don't either, and I don't personally, uh, but it's something that we have to do, and so it's you know, understanding it's your obligation, you got to do it. Just make sure you're doing it right and that you're not paying any more than you need to. Just your fair share, nothing more. Got it. So something that's really hot right now these days is NFTs. Super hot right now. I do want to talk a bit about taxes for NFTs. 
because there is taxes for the creator of the NFT and then the buyer of the NFT. Mm -hmm. So, well, first, let's just rewind, like, what is an NFT and then how do the taxes work? Yeah. So if you remember, we talked about what is cryptocurrency, right? Cryptocurrency is an Internet native version of money, right? And so money is an asset and there's many assets in the world. There's real estate, there's stocks, there's all these different things. So cryptocurrency, we took this one asset, money, and we made it internet native. NFTs is every other asset becoming internet native. So an NFT can represent real estate, it can represent artwork, it could represent shares in a company. All an NFT is, is just a internet native version of an asset. Simple as that. And it can be a real world asset that we're kind of putting on a blockchain. So you could take like a piece of real estate and make an NFT that represents that. Mm -hmm. Or it could be something that's truly just created on the internet. Like um, a lot of the NFT collections that are super popular today, like Bored Apes or CryptoPunks or things digital like that. Digital art. Yeah, digital art. Um, but it can be a lot more than just digital art. Um, digital art was just kind of one of the first ones. It could be uh, pieces of things that you use in a video game. Um, it could be tokens that give you membership to some sort of club. Um, it really, you, when you think of NFTs, you just need to think of asset on the internet mm -hmm. besides money. Mm -hmm. So cryptocurrency, money on the internet, NFTs, literally everything else. Hmm. Is it kind of like casino poker chips? Like it's something that you can trade, but it represents real money. So or something yeah, real. yeah. So you can have NFTs that are kind of just represent something else. Um, and there's, there's a lot of those, like I said, real estate's a big common example. Those ones, I don't actually find that interesting. Um, the real NFTs that I find interesting are the ones where the value is in the NFT. It's not just attempting to represent value that exists somewhere else. The value can be in the NFT itself. So um, like NFT artwork, right? The, it doesn't represent artwork. So it's not like I took a picture of the Mona Lisa and made an NFT of it, right? The, that NFT might have value, but the real value is the Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. But um, if you have truly internet native artwork, the NFT and the, thing, the value can be one and the same. Hmm. And the, the Mona Lisa is actually like a really common example when I'm explaining NFTs to people. So, for example, if I were to, um, in real life, right, let's say I've got the Mona Lisa right here, and right over here, I take, uh, have an artist recreate the Mona Lisa, stroke for stroke, every single thing is exactly the same, and I say, which one do you want? You want the original, right? Mm -hmm. Even though this one is stroke for stroke exactly the same, and I can even put this in a better case, I can even put like a glossing on it to make it last longer, but the original is still more valuable. Mm -hmm. And the reason the original is more valuable is when we're talking about um, art, for example, the value isn't in the art, mm -hmm. it's in the story. Hmm. It's in what that represents. And so just how you can take that Mona Lisa and I could right click save a version of the Mona Lisa and have a different copy of it, that doesn't change the fact that the original is where the value is. And you can have that same thing with NFTs. If it's a beautiful piece of art and the first one was the NFT, that's the valuable piece. You hmm. can take your different copies and save it and do whatever you want, but the value is still here. Mm. Yeah, and what's cool about NFTs is that you can't copy it. You can't just right click mm -hmm. and save as, and that's just because of the way blockchain works. Yeah, You can't exactly. double spend money, create fake new money. Yeah, you can save an image of it the same way you can't right click save the Mona Lisa, right? You can even, you can recreate your fake image, but that's not the original. And that, and what NFTs do is they make that really easy and provable to show who owns the original. Um, it's funny, there's probably not anyone on earth who could say with 100% certainty that the Mona Lisa in the Louvre is the original. True. Who knows, it's been hundreds of years, somebody could have swapped it out for a fake, done whatever. We're just kind of assuming right. that they've done their, their homework. But with NFTs, you don't need to assume. You can just look on the blockchain and know that's the original. Mm, that's cool, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. So then how do taxes work for NFTs? Yeah, so how do taxes work with NFTs? So there's two ways that we want to divide this. There's the taxes for the person creating the NFT, and then there's taxes for people investing in NFTs. Let's do the creator first. 
So if you're creating NFTs, this is really the same as if you were an artist creating paintings and, and selling them, right? When you create an NFT, the creating of the NFT is not a taxable event. Just like if you go in your bedroom and you paint a painting, you don't know taxes on that, yeah. right? So it's the selling of it that generates income. So if you make an NFT collection and you sell that, um, the dollar value of what you get in return is income. So if you sell it for a few ether that's worth 10 grand, you have 10 grand in income. Okay. Income. Now, if you then sell that, um, if you then sell that Ethereum down the road for $8,000 or $12,000, then you might have another capital gain or a loss on top of that income, mm -hmm. but the income amount is locked in at mm -hmm. the time you, that you get it. Got it. Okay. So creator, if you create an NFT, sell it, that's income. If um, you then do something with the Ethereum that you receive, that's a side thing. Also, if you're a creator making NFTs, just like when we talked about um, mining or earning income in other ways, you can deduct those expenses. So the gas fees that you spend setting up your NFT contract or sending things out, um, any materials that you needed to do, right? You're, you're a business. When creating the art. Yeah, so whatever expenses you had associated with that art, whether it's on the blockchain or not, those can all be taken as a business expense and a deduction. So those are the things that creators need to keep in mind of. Income when I sell it, make sure I get my expenses too, and then I only pay taxes on the net. Mm -hmm. Now, then we have investors. Mm -hmm. So these are people who aren't creating the NFTs, they're buying them. They might be buying them because they love them, right? They might, it might just be the same way, you know, you'll buy a piece of a painting that you like to hold, hang up in your house just because you love it. You might buy an NFT for that reason. Um, or you might be buying it as an investment. You might think that this is gonna go up in value. Same thing with art. There are people who buy art just because it's an asset. Mm -hmm. um, and actually art is a pretty well-performing asset that has done really well. Uh, so it does, it's no surprise that people are investing in NFT art as well. So when you're buying or investing in NFT, first off, generally when you buy an NFT, you're paying for it in cryptocurrency. Okay. Usually, um, if you're buying on OpenSea, which is a really popular NFT platform, you're paying in Ethereum. There's somewhere you can pay with Solana, other currencies. But regardless, if you're buying NFT with cryptocurrency, there's going to be a taxable event on disposing of that cryptocurrency. Mm. So if you bought one Ethereum for $1,000, it then goes up to $4,000, and you buy a $4,000 NFT with that Ethereum, the buying of the NFT is all actually also a sale selling. of that Ethereum. Okay. And so the gain or loss on that is something that you need to, that you um, incur by buying the NFT. Kind of like what you said about the car. If you buy mm -hmm. a car with Bitcoin and the car is worth 40,000, but you bought the Bitcoin at 10,000, then you've got 30, a, then you've got a gain. Okay. Also losses too, it works both ways. Um, so that's the first thing you need to keep in mind when you're an investor in NFTs. Now, um, after you have the NFT, it'll go up and down in value. And if you then sell that NFT, um, you know, let's say you bought it for one Ethereum, which was at $4,000, you turn around the next day and sell it for two Ethereum, keep it the same price, 4,000, so it's 8,000. You would then have a $4,000 gain on the sale of that NFT. Now, the one thing that's actually not clear um, is do you consider that a capital gain, a normal capital gain, or selling artwork? Yeah. And this is a kind of niche thing, but there's actually different tax rates for the two. So most tax professionals consider selling NFTs artwork, so there's a slightly higher rate on those. Um, but regardless of kind of, and that's kind of a little more niche than you're asking, but either way, there's gonna be some sort of gain or loss when you sell it. Got it. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, very similar than for cryptocurrency. The main nuance is you got to understand buying the NFT for crypto is taxable. And um, when you're disposing of it, if it's artwork, then there's a different tax rate for artwork. Got it. Good to know. Good to know. So we've touched on a lot of different things, a lot of things to not do and be careful about. Can we just wrap it all up in a bow? And what are tips and tricks to eliminate or minimize taxes. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the part that I like to talk about. This is the part that gets me excited because <laughs> the happy now, stuff. Like, yeah, now we can talk about, about saving money <laughs> and making sure that you keep what's yours. So one of the 
first tricks that I love to tell people about, and tricks probably not the right word, strategy, is that understanding the difference between short-term and long-term capital gains. And so for those of you guys who aren't familiar, and this is the same as with stocks, yeah. if you hold something for more than a year before you sell it, that's a long-term capital gain. If you buy it and sell it in less than a year, that's a short-term capital gain. And long-term capital gains are good because there's a limit on how high they can be taxed. They get taxed at a lower rate. So one of the first strategies is patience, is understanding that if you wait until that year, one year mark to sell your NFT or your cryptocurrency, you're gonna be taxed at a lower rate and that's gonna end up saving you money. So tip number one is understand short-term versus long-term capital gains. Tip number two is always understanding how much you paid for something or the correct accounting term is your basis in something. And the reason I say this is an important tip is, and this is actually something that a good um, financial advisor will tell you to do with your stocks, is a lot of times it makes sense to sell your losers. And they say, they t say that for people who invest in stocks all the time, is if you have a cryptocurrency that has lost value, a lot of times it makes sense to sell that because you're gonna then get that loss, which is going to reduce your income. And so it's important to always kind of know which cryptocurrency, if I sold it today, which would be a loss, or which ones would be a gain. And that sounds like a lot to keep track of. You're probably like, oh my gosh, I've got 10 different cryptocurrencies, I need, and the price changes every day. That's where software comes in super handy. So all the different softwares that I mentioned earlier, um, that we'll link to below. Those are all gonna have really easy tools where they'll tell you, hey, if you sold this today, it would be at a loss. If you sold this today, it would be at a gain. Mm -hmm. And so knowing when you can, we use the term harvest losses. Mm -hmm. It just means selling stuff at a loss so that you can um, reap that tax benefit. Mm -hmm. So that's a really big strategy. Um, and something that for all you guys listening, that when it's November, December, that's tax loss harvesting season. That's when everyone who invests in crypto should be looking at their coins and saying, okay, which one of these can I sell at a loss? Because if I sell it in December, that'll still be a loss for the whole year. So that's a big tip. Every November, December, make sure you're looking out for some tax loss harvesting options. Okay, so that's a really good tip. Before you move on to the next one, I have a question about that. Okay. Let's say you have a bunch of gains and you can offset that by selling a different coin at a loss. That's great tax strategy, but let's say I made a bunch of money in Bitcoin, I'm gonna sell it at a gain, and I can offset that loss with a different coin, but I actually really wanna keep that coin for the long term. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna just have to sell it because of a tax thing, so what do we do about that? So this is a really interesting question, getting a little technical, but I like to get technical and nerdy with it. So before I get into that, um, I wanna talk about something called a wash sale. So a wash sale is something that, again, some of your users might be familiar, or listeners might be familiar with, is a wash sale is something that is when you're trading stocks. So if you were to, let's say you bought some Tesla stock at $200, it drops down to $100. Let's say you then sell it. Okay, cool, now I have a $100 loss. And if the next day you rebuy that Tesla stock for 100 bucks, um, that's called a wash sale, right? Because you've basically sold something and then rebought it right away. And under the uh, rules that we have today for stocks, you're not allowed to take that loss of 100 bucks because even though you sold it at a loss, because you rebought it, you're still in the same place. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how it works with stocks and equities. With cryptocurrency, they're not stocks or equities. They're not securities. And so because of that, the wash sale rules technically don't apply. Um, there is, I do have to caveat it, there is some legislation right now going through Congress where people are talking about changing these rules and expanding them to apply to cryptocurrency. But as of right now, it does not apply. This might change for next year or in the future. But so currently, you can actually sell cryptocurrency at a loss, maybe on like December 30th, and then in January 15th, you could then rebuy that cryptocurrency. So you recognize the loss last year, wait a few days, buy it again, and now you still have that same cryptocurrency at roughly the same price, but you've got to lock in that loss. Mm. So 
Understanding that rule and navigating that is something that we have done with a lot of our clients. It's a little bit more advanced because you kind of need to think through the selling it, taking the loss, and then buying back in. But it is something that you can do as of now, but who knows what's going to happen with that legislation that's in Congress right now. Nice. It almost sounds too good to be true. So probably yeah. the government's going to do something about that. Yeah, but it's totally legal and it's, it's totally um, allowable under the rules as it is today. Cool. All right, so moving on to some other tips and tricks to save money mm -hmm. on taxes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we talked about tax loss harvesting. We talked about short-term versus long-term. Um, another one, and I want to kind of make sure, I kind of mentioned it before, is understanding the income rules around cryptocurrency. Now, again, this is one where there are some pending lawsuits and legislations where people are trying to maybe change these or get clarity. But as of right now, the way it works is that you, if you earn cryptocurrency as income, that needs to be taxed as income. And the types of income can be if you receive cryptocurrency from a hard fork, that's considered income. Um, whether you get it from an airdrop, whether you earn it from staking, um, passive income as interest from like a Celsius or a BlockFi, all those things are different types of income. Now, one tip there is that, and this is really important for airdrops and hard forks, and um, without kind of going too into the details, if anyone's not familiar with an airdrop or a hard fork, it's essentially when you have cryptocurrency sent to your wallet um, that was kind of created from out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, so whether it's, you know, Bitcoin split in two and now you have, you still have your Bitcoin, but you have this other new hard fork version, Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin Gold, whatever you want to call it. Um, or if people just kind of, air, it's called airdrop where they just give out cryptocurrency to different wallets. So if you get one of those, um, which is pretty common, it's only considered income when you claim it. And so this is something that I always kind of talk people through is saying, Okay, yes, you got this cryptocurrency for free. Um, if you claim it, it's considered income and you owe taxes on it. If you just leave it there, if you never go through and claim it, you don't owe taxes on it. And so that's something that people need to be thoughtful of if you're kind of one of those people who's getting a hard fork or an airdrop, is just keeping, um, keeping tabs on those rules. Because what can happen is you can claim it today and it might be worth something and you pay, owe taxes at, as income, and remember, income gets taxed higher than capital gains. Mm -hmm. And then if you sell it for a loss later, you're getting that deduction, but it's a capital loss. And that's going to reduce your capital gains, which is at a lower rate. So you can actually put yourself in a bad situation by claiming things that are kind of you think might be worthless just because they seem like have value, having value at the time. Mm -hmm. So that's another tip. To um, not claim free Or to just, to just know that as soon as you claim it, that's when you've got income. Oh, so, so just, you could claim it later. Is that what you're saying? You could claim saying? it later. You can, yeah. So, for example, if you get an airdrop on December 30th, maybe wait till January to claim it because then you get a oh, whole other year before sense. you have to pay taxes on it. Okay. So, being smart about when you claim that income. Exactly. Because you don't have to claim it right away. You don't have to claim it right away. Um, and if you do claim it, it's income, which is taxed at a higher rate. So, just keep being mindful of that, knowing when and knowing, knowing the rules. Is it an option to not claim it? Of course, yeah. Um, so some airdrops, the way it'll work is if you're holding the cryptocurrency in your own wallet, um, it's always up to you to claim it. If you have coins on like Binance or Coinbase, a lot of times when an airdrop or hard fork happens, they'll give you those coins a lot of times without you asking for it. Um, and if that happens, you have no choice. They've actually given you income against your will. Uh, which is a really unique thing about cryptocurrency um, in that through these air, airdrops and hard forks, you might get income that you weren't even expecting. And mm -hmm. in some cases, it can be a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's definitely something that um, unique to cryptocurrency and that I think there's going to be some changes um, as this industry gets older and evolves. There might be, you know, give you options as to whether or not they give it to you. But as of now, that's how it works. Awesome. Is that it for your tips and tricks? Yeah, so we've talked about um, being smart about short-term, long-term. We've talked about tax loss harvesting. Um, we've covered a couple of the different income items. So I think those are some really good kind of fundamental tips and tricks for people to keep in mind. And then really the, the overarching ending tip is that 
the first step is just getting your records together and using something to do that. So using those software tools, having someone hack that software help you kind of get everything together and figuring out where you stand, mm -hmm. right? Because so many people are petrified at the idea that, oh my gosh, I might owe taxes on this. I don't understand it. So it they seems just avoid it completely. And they avoid it completely. But you would be amazed how many people come to us thinking, hey, I probably owe like $100,000 in taxes, um, help me out. And then when we run the numbers, uh, we actually realize that, hey, if you run these numbers correctly, you actually lost money and you're, you actually are owed a refund. And there's so many times where that happens. And that actually leads me to one more bonus tip that I'll throw in there. And this is, it's this, it's when you are, trading cryptocurrency, you as the taxpayer, you actually have some choices mm -hmm. that you can make in how you pay your taxes. And that's through called something called a calculation method. And so what that means is I can have three people who all buy Bitcoin on the same day, sell it on the same day, buy, it, buy some more on the same day, sell it all on the same day. They've done exactly the same thing. But I could run their numbers and all three of them could owe different amounts in taxes mm -hmm. and they can all be correct. And the reason is with cryptocurrency, you can choose the way that you calculate your gains and losses. So like, for example, the most common way is called FIFO, first in, first out, FIFO, first in, first out. What that means is, let's say you buy a Bitcoin in January, you buy a Bitcoin in February, you buy a Bitcoin in March you sell Bitcoin in December, which Bitcoin did you sell? Mm. So if you choose FIFO, that means you sell the first one. Mm -hmm. um, if you choose something called LIFO, you say, actually, the one I sold was this last one. Last in, first out. Last in, first out. Um, or you could even do something called HIFO, which is called highest in, first out, where you sell the most expensive. Um, mm. There's all these different ways. So basically, you can pick and not pick and choose, but you can use methods that will come to different answers. And those answers can give you very different tax um, obligations or one method could mean you owe taxes. One could mean you're getting a refund. Wow. And again, this is something where software makes it super easy because when you use these tools, you can say, give me a FIFO report, give me a LIFO report, show me my different options and then I can see which one makes the most sense for me and my personal tax situation. That is amazing. I'm sure that's gonna help a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely something we, we, all, we do with all of our clients is kind of walk them through like, hey, here's your different options. Here's the pros and cons of each one. Mm -hmm. um, maybe for a little bonus, what I'll give you is that when you, it, let's say you choose FIFO, for example. So first in, first out. Um, one of the benefits of that is if you're selling first in, that means you're selling older coins first. Mm -hmm. You're more likely to be in long-term capital gains because you're mm -hmm. selling the older stuff mm -hmm. versus if you use something like LIFO, which is you're selling the most recent, you're more likely to hit short-term capital gains, right? So different things like that, understanding the differences between each calculation method can save you a ton of money in taxes and there's software that makes it super easy. Okay, this is so good. A huge part of investing is avoiding taxes or not avoiding, but mm -hmm. minimizing, not yeah. paying more than you need to. Yeah. There's a lot of strategies for taxes in real estate and crypto is no different. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we always talk about in, in the tax world, there's tax avoidance and tax evasion. Mm -hmm. Tax avoidance, perfectly legal, right? All you're doing is making sure you don't pay any more than you owe. Tax evasion, that's when you're lying and, and cheating. That's illegal. But everything we've talked about today is tax avoidance, just being smart and um, understanding kind of all those different rules. Mm -hmm. And one other thing that um, I want to make sure that people understand, since we're talking about avoidance and evasion, is that um, every single person should really take a look at their actual tax returns because what happens is on your tax return, there's this form, the 1040, I don't expect people to know the actual name of the form, but at the top of that form, uh, 1040, Schedule 1, it's a form that everybody fills out, there's a question at the top of that tax return that says, did you essentially buy, trade, sell, or use virtual currency during the year? And 
a lot of times if you use TurboTax, TurboTax asks you a ton of questions, right? And you don't always think that when you answer a question on TurboTax that it's actually gonna show up how you answered it on your tax return. Um, or if you maybe sent your stuff to your accountant, I've seen a lot of times where your accountant just assumes that you didn't trade crypto. Um, and you might have that little check mark ticked as no, when in the reality, the answer was yes. And that's a really big deal. Hmm. Because a lot of people don't understand that when you fill out your taxes, you are basically doing that under penalty of perjury, right? You are, it's almost like lying, the equivalent of lying in court when you put something wrong on your tax return. And that little question, it's at the top of every single person's return. It's a really big deal. It's something they added in 2019. Um, you need to make sure that that's your tax return. It's your responsibility as a taxpayer to know what's on there and make sure that that's correct. Mm. So definitely another thing that people want to keep an eye out for. Okay, I'll definitely be checking mine too. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, there's a lot of people who check them and they're like, oh my gosh, the question was wrong. <laughs> oh, okay, so yeah, if you did anything in Bitcoin or any crypto, you want to say yes. Yes, yeah, so, so there hasn't been a ton of clarity around like the details, but generally if you're doing anything taxable, selling, uh, trading, swapping, you're going to need to check yes. Mm -hmm. If all you've done is just hold or maybe just bought cryptocurrency, you can you can probably check no, but to be honest, I tell all my clients, even if you've just bought and didn't sell, just check yes to be safe. Yes, better safe than sorry. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for making a really dry topic really interesting. I've learned a bunch and thank I'm going to go get on this software right now and talk to my accountant about it. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to just clearly because you're so passionate about it. Otherwise, how can someone make such a dry topic interesting? <laughs> What do you think, what does crypto mean for the world and for the future? Yeah, absolutely. And for me, I kind of alluded to it earlier. The reason I started this firm and I'm in this business, I'm not really here to make money. I'm here because I'm super passionate about what cryptocurrency can do and what cryptocurrency means. And I'm just taking the skills that I have and doing my part to kind of make this industry more legitimate and make this industry more successful. And so to me, cryptocurrency is money, but it's money created by the people. It's not controlled by different governments. It's not controlled by bureaucrats. It's money created by the people for the people. And the value in it comes from the people. And the reason I got so into cryptocurrency was all the different ways that this money, which is by the people, for the people, and it's internet native, the way that it can improve people's lives, mm -hmm. the way that it can make it easier for people with families in remote areas like the Philippines or in Southern Africa to send money back and forth, the way that it can empower people who maybe live in Venezuela or Zimbabwe who don't have currencies that are strong and stable. It'll give them some way to save their wealth. Mm -hmm. um, the way that you can take your Bitcoin with you anywhere you go and no one can steal that from you. All these different things that cryptocurrency can be used to improve the world, to improve people's lives, to have more inclusion. Um, for example, with, with a lot of people in this world are unbanked. They don't mm -hmm. even have bank accounts. Um, if you look up the statistics, it's really shocking how many people can't access basic financial services because they don't have a bank account. But with cryptocurrency, all you need is a smartphone. And almost all the world has access to the internet and smartphones. And so you can put financial tools in the hands of people who never had them. You can improve the finances of people in the existing system. And you can do it all with this open, permissionless, free tool that's made by the people. And when I finally understood what that meant and the impacts that it could have on the world, I was all in. And I've done and dedicated my career towards promoting that vision and towards making it more easy and accessible for people. Wow, I just got chills. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, I appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me on, on the show. It's been absolutely a, a blast. Um, yeah, it was fun, I learned a lot. So if someone wants to learn more about you, about your services, or just learn more about crypto taxes, where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually have a course that we teach. And when I say course, don't get too intimidated. It's something you could do in like a weekend um, where we teach all the nitty gritty tax, crypto tax rules that you need to learn. Um, and so it's, it's really funny. I have a lot of traders who are clients 
who they'll spend thousands of dollars and months trying to learn how to be a little bit better and earn 1% more money in trading, but they won't spend a weekend learning how to save 30, 40% in taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and so we teach all those strategies. So I go really in depth in the videos, teach you all the different things that you need to know. We've talked a lot about software in this course. I actually bring in all the software providers and they demo the software and we teach you kind of click by click how to use all these tools, um, how to take all these things that we've talked about and put them into practice. And we've condensed all those into our course. And so we'll definitely leave a link for anybody who's interested in that course. Uh, it'll absolutely save you money in taxes. And what I always tell people is you're going to be paying taxes for the rest of your life. And so if you learn how to save money on taxes, that's not an expense, mm -hmm. that's an investment. Mm -hmm. And it's an investment that's gonna pay dividends for as long as you're a taxpayer, mm -hmm. which is gonna be the rest of your life. Right. <laughs> and so anybody who's interested in learning more, really grasping this topic and making sure that they're on top of their, their finances, um, absolutely check out our course. If anybody wants to get in touch with me personally, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Tavo Abate, that's the easiest way to tweet at me. And of course, you can also check out our website, which is www.arbitusgroup.com. Okay, awesome. Okay, I will drop links to everything you mentioned below in the description, so definitely go check them out. And that is it for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that what you learned will make tax season a little bit less stressful for you this year. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. I post new videos about making money, saving money, and investing money every single week. So I will see you next week, same time, same place. Bye.